Good afternoon again. I'm, I'm Stan Akins. I'm the Dean of the College of Business at East Carolina. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the Canandan Leadership Speaker Series featuring Peter Post. This event has been a collaborative effort of many people and groups across the East Carolina University. Two such people are a couple of ECU alums, Steve and Ellen Cunanan, who have provided the financial support, support for the speaker series. They understand the importance of hearing from the great leaders of our time and have opened our minds to new ideas and thoughts and of supporting education in the broadest sense of the word. We are grateful for their support. As many of you know, over the last five years, the College of Business has put leadership development in front and center in its curriculum by introducing four required courses and a portfolio that every student in our college takes. In this competitive job market, it simply isn't enough to know business fundamentals and subjects. Graduates from, all over the, uh, from schools all over the country can compute net present values and prepare balance sheets. But you need to bring something more to the table if you want to capture the top job opportunities that you want. The college listened to employers and developed a leadership series to cover the topics that the businesses felt were lacking in most business graduates. To my knowledge, our college has the most complete leadership development program available in the entire country, and we've researched it. Most large firms have found that they have to provide this training to their executives internally. Our students know it before they graduate and can use this skill when they seek employment. The third course in our leadership development series is professional business development. The text for this course was written by our speaker today, Peter Post, the director of the Emily Post Institute. He is the author of five etiquette books, including the one that we use in that course. He leads business seminars around the world for major corporations and since 2004 has authored a syndicated etiquette advice column. He's also spoken at universities and given hundreds of interviews. He's the great grandchild of the famed Emily Post and has been running the Emily Post Institute since 1999. Please join me in welcoming Peter Post. And Dr. Erkins, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you all about etiquette. Um, it's not very often that I could say that I can get a thousand people into a room and actually have them be willing to hear about etiquette. Um, that's not, that's not, uh, it's not something I would expect, and yet it's very heartening to see you here. Today, what I want to talk about and what the, what the program is, is based on is why business etiquette matters. What's, what's the point behind it that, that it has some value to you and how can I show you that would actually give you some value um, in terms of some tools that you could use to be able to build better relationships in your life, both your business life and frankly your personal life as well. Um, it's, it's really not about manners, which is what most people think of it as, that thing that you might say, uh, it's about which fork you use at a meal. And if that's all it was about, and I were gonna stand up here for 45 minutes to give you 60 or 70 manners, well, frankly, I'd be bored by that, and I wouldn't do it, and I wouldn't expect you to want me to do it. Um, there's something more valuable about etiquette than simply manners themselves. And what that is is the ability to help you make choices in the way you interact with people at the same time that you build a relationship with the person rather than tear it down or hurt it. And that's really the goal here is just to give you those tools to be able to do it. So to start, I want to just ask you a simple question. The question is, are Americans ruder today than they were 20 or 30 years ago? I, just a show of hands, how many people think we're ruder today than we were 20 or 30 years ago? If you were standing up here and you looked out here, there's probably more than the American public says, because the American public will tell you that 69% are, we're, we're ruder today than we were 20 or 30 years ago. And, and rudeness certainly, I think, exists um, in, in a couple of classes that I did today, one for the honors group and one for the professionalism class, the 3200 level class, I think it is. Um, we talked about reasons why, and it, certainly the recession 
and the difficulty that that gives for people's lives in terms of downsizing of corporations, people losing their jobs, people having to do more with less, people being paid less than they were being paid before, all of that kind of thing adds tremendously to what I call stress. Stress in the workplace, stress in people's lives. And unfortunately, when you have stress in people's lives, particularly in a business environment, what you have is incivility and rudeness as a result of the stress. People treat each other more unfriendly. They're caustic, they're rude to the person, rather than trying to figure out a way to interact with them in a way that builds. And the worst part of it is, is that that incivility and rudeness leads to more stress, and we get into this vicious circle, and it doesn't seem to want to end. And so what, what we want to do, what I want to do for you for a minute is just look at what happens when there is rudeness in the workplace. And um, I say this with great trepidation. I've been told to be very careful of this. But UNC did do a study about rudeness in the workplace. And I am going to quote it. And I apologize because I understand what I'm doing is a faux pas. And so I'll apologize for it in the start. But, um, they did do this rudeness study, and what they did was they talked to 1,400 people, and they asked them if they had been treated rudely at work. And what's interesting is that 775 of those people had been treated rudely one way or another at work. They reported it as such. And when they reported it, the things that you see up there are things that were actual ways that they responded to that rudeness. So some of them lost work time avoiding instigator, 28% said that. That means, you know what was happening here? A person was at work, and somebody was treating them rudely, and they were going to be walking towards each other in a corridor or a hall, and the person who was being treated rudely was ducking into a restroom or getting out of the person's way. They did not want to associate with that other person, so they were making it that way. And then we have people who lost work time worrying. Well, 53% said they worried about something. When I do this for seminars for businesses, I'll ask people, have you ever been in a situation where you spent, hello? Have you, ever, have you ever been in a situation where you spent some time worrying about a relationship, a situation with another person at work, as opposed to doing your work? And everybody seems to go through those kinds of situations. I see heads nodding. Yeah, they've, they've experienced that, and it does happen. Well, when that happens, 53% of them are spending their time doing that rather than working. Well, that's lost productivity. But what happens when we decrease the effort, the actual work effort, 22% of them say they do that. And an astonishing 12% say that they actually left their jobs. Now, having somebody leave a job happens at work. All, anybody who runs HR, runs businesses, knows that they're going to lose people over time. But to lose people for rudeness and incivility in the workplace, something that's preventable, that's not acceptable because it's too expensive to replace a worker for any reason. Good reasons, fine, but a bad reason, like people being rude to each other, not acceptable. What's interesting about this study is it found one other thing. It looked at who the instigator was of rudeness. Note, it's three times more likely to be a person of higher status. It is not a coworker to a coworker. It is a person who is a boss treating an employee rudely. That's much more likely what's going on. For the employee, the person that you're likely to be in work in that kind of a situation, note the last little point up there. The person who's doing the rudeness is likely to be a valued employee, and he's not going to be fired, which is unfortunate. We have to figure out how to break this cycle of rudeness. It's the only way to deal with it, because we're not just going to get rid of the people who are being rude. That's not going to happen. So when we look at that study, a couple of things come out of it. They come out that there's lost productivity, there's lost profits, there's poor retention, for sure, but there's also trouble recruiting. You want to be able to recruit the best and the brightest. But if the reputation of your company out in the world is that that's not a good place to work, it's very hard to get people to choose to work for you. That whole job interview and job thing is not a one-way street. Not only is a person or a business looking at you for a job, but you should be looking at the business for the job, and is that a place you want to work? And if it's got a reputation as a place that's unfriendly to work in, do you really want to spend eight hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks of the year in that kind of an environment? And you'll choose to take your skills somewhere else. And this is all for stuff that can be prevented. We don't have to have that work environment be a rude place, okay? 
One other thing that I wanted to show you was Gallup supported what we saw in the UNC study. They discovered that people join companies and then they leave managers. Well, the manager's treating somebody badly, and so they leave, but they love their job. I do this column that, that, that you referenced for the, for the Boston Globe, and I get questions all the time from people who love their job but hate their boss, what can they do about it? And my answer to them is they can try talking to the boss about what's going on and the difficulties, but they're not in a position to change what the boss's attitude and the way they do business. The best that they can do is to decide are they going to put up with the boss because they love the job, or are they going to decide that maybe it's time for them to look for a job in a place where they would enjoy the boss more and the atmosphere more? And unfortunately, that's the reality of the situation today. But the other thing that Gallup did was it also said, well, what happens when you have a great manager? We've just seen what happens when you have people that treat people rudely. But what happens when you have a great manager? Well, what happens when you have a great manager is that you're more profitable, you have greater productivity, and you have greater customer loyalty. So it makes sense that where we, have an, we can create an atmosphere that is a positive atmosphere in the workplace, we can not only be successful within ourselves, but our businesses are more successful. So for everybody who's running a business or going to run a business, think about the difference between those two statistics. The UNC study that shows that when you treat people badly, you end up with poorer productivity and poorer profits and harder to keep people and not able to recruit people. But when you treat people well and you foster a positive work environment, then you get these kinds of results. It's pretty good. What sort of things are we talking about that are important in the world out there that, that, that employers would tell you are important? Well, what a etiquette offense gets you fired in essence? Ladders.com did a survey. And they found that 70%, 69.7, so 70% of executives said they'd fire an employee for some kind of an etiquette offense. What was interesting is, so what, what are we talking about here? What kind of an etiquette offense would get you fired? And I was really fascinated by this. They, they had a bunch of different things, but among their top five things were three things that I want to share with you. And the first one was bad language. Interestingly, Language is becoming a real issue in the workplace today. I see it in articles and stuff that we've been seeing for about the past five years, that people using foul language in the workplace are ultimately going to find themselves on the short end of the stick. The second thing is excessive workplace gossip. And gossip is something that has really become a problem in the workplace. They found that when people gossip, all of the focus goes to the gossiping that's going on, and people become frustrated by that gossip and the way that they're being talked about, and they really don't appreciate it. So businesses are discovering that it hurts their productivity, and they've changed their minds. I, had a, um, I did a, a program like this for uh, Fidelity and um, a subsidiary of Fidelity, which is called Boston Coach. Now, Boston Coach is a large limousine company that has affiliates all over the country. And once a year, they bring the affiliates to Boston for a big meeting. And I did a, a keynote speech for them. And in the middle of the speech, I brought up this statistic about excessive gossip. And a hand shot up in the back of the room and said, I got to say something to you. I can't believe you're bringing this up as something because I own a garage and a limo company in Los Angeles. And I have had a real problem with the drivers, get this, not office workers, the drivers in the garage gossiping, and it was causing real discord in the drivers and problems for the company. Then he said he instituted a no gossip policy. And most of the drivers bought into it, but one of them didn't. And he found that the most effective way to convince them all not to gossip was to fire the guy that didn't. And so he fired him. And I thought, boy, this guy really does get it. He gets what the effect of it is, and he's willing to make a rule about it, and then he's willing to enforce it. And this was somebody in a situation that isn't what I would have thought of as a place where gossip would occur or where it would cause a problem, but it caused a great problem for them. And finally, the third one is too many personal calls. That cell phone that you have, is a real problem at work today. And the reason it's a real problem is because unlike old days when you had an office phone 
And as a result of having that office phone, you couldn't take personal calls at work because the switchboard operator knew not to put them through to you, so to speak. Now you can get that phone call at work and you can step out into a hallway or out into the yard outside behind the building and have your conversation. And people are doing it all the time. Bosses are noticing that people have done it and it's a real problem. Interestingly, what's not up on that list and what is now becoming probably the biggest hassle for people who run companies relative to cell phones isn't the phone call that the people are taking, it's the texting because the texting can be done totally surreptitiously. Don't have to see it happen at all. And a lot of work time, up to two or three hours a day of work time is being lost to people texting and companies are not going to put up with that for long. So those are some of the things that'll get you fired. With that background, the question then becomes, well, what can you do? How can you affect this sense of rudeness. And, and so what I want to do is I want to show you two ideas that are really important to being able to ground yourself in the tools that I want to give you. And the first one comes from a story about Bruno. Now Bruno, it turns out, was a German shepherd. And Bruno belonged to Emily Post back in the 1880s when her family used to go up to Bar Harbor, Maine. And they went to Bar Harbor, Maine each summer. They took Bruno with them, and Bruno had a nice pen outside, and they had a place along the water. And next door lived what I can only describe as one of those little yappy dogs. You know what I'm talking about? It just yaps all the time. It's like a little shark. It's going after Bruno. Bruno's in his pen. He can't get out. And so this dog loves to bark at Bruno. Well, one day, it turned out the yappy dog wasn't yapping anymore. They didn't hear it. And so they looked around for Bruno. And he wasn't in his pen. <laughs> so they, they looked a little more and found Bruno next door with the yappy dog in his mouth. And it's what happened next that was so interesting to them because he did not snap that little dog in half and end the problem of the barking, which he could have done. Instead, he trotted down to the water's edge and out onto the end of a dock and he dumped the dog into the water at the end of the dock. <laughs> at which point, at which point, he went home and the little dog floundered around outside the dock, got around to the water's edge, came home, and you know what? That dog never barked at Bruno again. And the moral of this story is that it's not if you're going to do something, it's how you go about doing it that matters. Every day in your life, you have choices about how you're going to interact with people. And you can choose to solve the problem, the issue, in dealing with the person, and in the process of solving it, hurt the relationship, or you can choose a course of action that builds the relationship at the same time that it solves the problem. And the how matters in everything you do, whether it's with a significant other, it's your friends, it's with teachers, it's with people you work with, it's people you meet in, in just in your general life in the world. You have choices. So make choices that don't tear down relationships, build relationships, the how matters. The second point that I want to make comes from a poll that was done, part of that poll that I showed you at the beginning. And it asks this question. It says, on a frequent to occasional basis, do you encounter people using their cell phones rudely? How many people here see people using cell phones rudely? <laughs> okay, so if I look around the room, 89% of Americans, which is about what we saw go up in the room here, say they see people using cell phones rudely. And I think in some ways that makes sense. I see that happen out there. And I think a lot of people see cell phones being used in a way that's unfriendly to other people. The second question they asked is the really interesting question to me. Have you used your cell phone in a loud or annoying manner in the past few years, the pa past few months? How many people have done that? When I ask that, it's interesting how few hands go up. The American public, 8%, okay? It doesn't take a genius to see the difference between 89 and 8, okay? I don't think all those people up there in the 89% are seeing the same 8% being rude. What I think's really going on is that it's easier to see rudeness in other people than it is to see it in yourself. If my cell phone rings and I'm having a conversation with you, I can choose to either take it out of my pocket and answer it, but you're gonna think I'm rude if I do that. Or I can reach into my pocket and I can push a little button on the top of it and I can send it to my voicemail. Now that's a much harder thing for me to do because in all my life I have been taught over and over and over again, answer a phone when it rings. But if I answer that phone, I'm being rude to you. So I do the harder thing, which is to push the button, send it to voicemail, and as a result, I build my relationship with you. It makes a difference. 
whether or not I see the rudeness in myself or in somebody else, how I handle it. And the second thing that's important about this is, is that I don't think rudeness is intentional. I don't think when a person answers that cell phone, they're intentionally trying to be rude to you. That's not what's going on. But what is going on is unintentional rudeness. And when you are rude to somebody, what happens? How, does, how do you respond? You respond because the person says, what did you do that for? With, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't realize, and, and the first thing out of your mouth is an apology. Wouldn't it be better to get it right the first time push the button on the thing rather than answer the phone and have the person appreciate you then have to apologize. If we could reduce the number of times we apologize, we could be more successful with the people we interact with. And that brings me to the first goal of goals that I have, actually, well, let me back up because the, the perspective and the how, those matter. And that all brings me to the first of three goals. The first goal is to think before you act. It sounds simple. Most of etiquette is common sense. It isn't rocket science, it isn't great revelations, but it's stating things that help you to do better in your building of relationships with people. And the most important one is to think before you act. And the reason it's important is because if you act before you think, you're gonna get it wrong and then you're gonna have to apologize instead of thinking first and then get it right and not have to apologize, build the relationship. Once you do that thinking, then you want to make choices that build relationships. That is the best way I know to actually solve the problem of resolving the issue and building the relationships, to make choices that are good for everybody involved, not just for yourself. That answering the phone, by not answering it, it's good for everybody else. It's not, I'm the one that's it's harder to do. These two don't work without a third one. And the third one is to be sincere. Sincerity matters. If you're insincere, what happens is, is that people don't believe you. And if they don't believe you, then they don't trust you. And if you lose people's trust in business today, it's very hard to get it back. And people do not want to do business with people they don't trust. So sincerity is a key part of those three goals. You think first before you act. You make choices that build relationships for everybody, even if it might be harder on you and you do it sincerely. And you follow that formula, and you have a chance to build, to make more choices in a way that builds rather than hurts relationships as you resolve problems, okay? So, with that in mind, what's the issue with confidence and trust? By doing those three things, you're a more confident person. And confidence is what encourages trust. This is really the key to the whole thing because trust is the basis of all business relationships. And when you have people's trust, you're successful. But once you've lost that trust, it's gone forever. You can't get it back. It's very hard to regain it, okay? So if etiquette's in action, I put it in action through my three goals. The interesting thing is I talked about manners at the beginning, but etiquette isn't just about manners. It's also about something we call principles. And there are three principles of etiquette. And by using these three principles, you can make choices that build the relationships. Those principles are, one, to be considerate. And that means having empathy for what's going on in a situation around you right now. It doesn't mean you value judge it, but you understand who's affected and how are they affected. Once you've understood the consideration in a situation, you show respect. And you show respect by considering options that you have to, to operate or to solve a problem, and then choosing the solution that builds the relationship at the same time it solves the problem, okay? So you choose to act in a way that builds rather than tears down. And finally, if you do it sincerely, you're being honest. And honesty is an integral part of how you interact with people because when you're honest, people can trust you. But if you're dishonest with them, they don't. And that has to do with that whole sincerity thing as well. So you're acting sincerely and you're being trustful, truthful. Three principles, that's the basis of etiquette. It's not about the manners. You could figure out the manners yourself. What it's about is being considerate and being respectful and being honest. I want to put it into action for you, just give you an idea of a problem that could exist for you in the business world and think a little bit about how you might solve this problem. So here's the problem. 
During a client meeting, you notice a client sneezing, sneeze into his hands. Five minutes later, the meeting draws too close, and the client comes over to shake hands and greet you. And he's got all over his hand. What do you do, OK? I actually had a young woman call the Emily Post Institute and ask me what to do in this situation. She was crying on the phone because her boss had just yelled at her for not having shook the person's hand. And so I said, well, let's think about this for a minute. Who was affected and how were they affected? That's being considerate. And who's being affected and how they were being affected is the boss and the company and you, her, and um, the other person. And how were they affected? Well, the other person, if she doesn't shake hands, is going to be pretty negatively affected. They're going to wonder why. Because if I extend my hand to shake hands with you, you've got to put your hand out to shake hands with me. So when it doesn't happen, it's like freaking you out. If you shake hands, that's good for the other people, but it's really hard on you. But what about the third option? What, why couldn't you say something to the person like, oh, I'm sorry, I've got a bad cold, I don't want to shake your hand, but it's awfully nice to meet you. Doesn't that get you out of the situation without having to shake hands? But remember honesty? <laughs> now we've got a problem because you've told the white lie. And if five minutes later you're over shaking somebody else's hand, you're caught in the white lie. And unfortunately, you get caught in white lies at the worst possible time. So even though it's the hardest on you, as we examine the options, by far the best option is to go ahead and shake hands and then say to yourself, after I shake hands, I'm going to the restroom, I'm going to wash my hands, which you should be doing anyways. The point behind the story isn't that you probably didn't know what you ought to do. Most all of you would know that you ought to shake hands. It's to be able to shake hands in a confident manner where you put your hand out there rather than kind of in a I don't want to shake hands with you but I'm going to do it type of a thing that transmits to that person through your body language that you didn't really want to shake hands with them. So that confidence things come back into play. What I want to spend a couple of minutes doing is just talking to you specifically about communications and some of the things that are really important about how you communicate in the business world. Um, what I have that I think is probably more important than anything else is what we call the bulletin board rule. And that is that if what you have to say to somebody is something you couldn't put up on a bulletin board for anybody to read, then you shouldn't be texting it or emailing it or tweeting it or putting it on a social networking page. Be very careful. Those are all public means of people seeing stuff. You can't prevent people from seeing stuff on those types of communication. And yet people routinely make the mistake of sending an email or a text or putting something up on a, a, social, a Facebook page that later on they really wish hadn't been up there. They didn't want people to see. They thought it was private, but it wasn't private. It was public. Um, an example of that for you happened in USA Today on March 1st. There was a huge story about a federal judge who had been caught because he had emailed a racist joke about the president to seven of his friends. And his comment was, when he was asked about it by the press, and I'll explain how it got out in just a second, it was not intended by me in any way to become public. If it wasn't intended by him to become public, he should never have sent it on a government computer through his email account to seven people who he thought were his friends. Because at least one of those friends thought the joke was interesting enough that he forwarded it to some of his friends. And those friends forwarded it to some friends until it ended up on the desk of a local reporter who went back down through the thread and saw that the judge was the person who had initiated it. And the judge has spent days and days and days since dealing with this problem that he caused because he didn't understand the difference between public and private. And he should never have sent something out that he couldn't have put on a bulletin board for anybody to read. Another example was a fellow named uh, uh, James Andrews was his name. And he was vice president at Ketchum PR, which is a large PR firm. And he was going to Memphis, Tennessee to visit FedEx, which was their large client, a really large client. And as he got to Memphis, he tweeted the following tweet. He said, the true confession, but I'm in one of those towns where I'd scratch my head and say I'd rather die than live here. 
By the time he walked into FedEx's office, they already had seen the tweet, and they wanted to know what on earth he thought he was doing sending that kind of a message about them. And he and the president of Ketchum spent the next several weeks dealing with the press fallout from this, as well as the people from FedEx who had to answer questions about it. Rather than spending time doing the work for PR, on PR for FedEx that they should have been doing, they were trying to fix this problem. Remember I said about the UNC study that people of higher status do the rudeness, and furthermore, they're not likely to get fired? James, Ketch James Andrews did not get fired, but he did spend a lot of time trying to solve the problem that he created, okay? So, five tips for email communication for you. The first, be timely. 24 hours is a typical rule. Some businesses have rules of responding to people within four hours. So please be timely. Number two, let it simmer. Don't just hit the send button right away, especially if it has anything to do with an opinion or frustration on your part, because they're gonna hear that opinion or frustration in your writing. Three, be careful of the two in subject fields. More people have been caught in the, sub, in the two field by having sent something to Peter, their friend, but Peter was their boss as well. And instead of their friend's address showing up in the two field, it was their boss's and they sent the email. And as a result, something very unfriendly happened to them at work, okay? Be really careful of that. Subject field, what's the first thing people see in an email you send to them? They see the subject field, yet it's the last thing we tend to spend any time writing. Make mistake in it, and you look like you make mistakes. Be very careful with your subject field as well. Tone matters. You have a tone of voice in your writing that'll come across to people. They'll hear it. One way to understand what the tone of voice that you have in your writing is, take an email, take a piece of writing you've done, go into a room where you can close the door, and then read it out loud. Not to yourself silently, but read it out loud. When you read it out loud, you'll hear your tone. You'll hear if you're a little unfriendly, if you're a little bit abrupt and short with the person. And if you hear it, believe me, the person you're sending it to will hear it. So tone matters. It's not just the words on the page, but it's the tone behind them that's gonna make a difference. And finally, avoid things like text speak. You know, the tomorrow, or the see you later, or the before, those things. I also caution people that in business communications, those little emoticons, the happy faces, and those kinds of things, unless you know somebody real well, they're a good friend, don't use them. Not worth it. Be careful of all caps. All caps can be a problem because people think you're shouting at them. So do be careful of those as well. Question for you. At an important meeting, a cell phone begins ringing, and after the second ring, everyone realizes that it's your phone. What would you do? Remember we said think about options? Well, one option might be to try to pretend it wasn't your phone. Sit there and just let it ring and hope that it stops ringing before people realize it's your phone. Be one way to handle it. Another way that you could handle it would be to answer it and try to talk softly right in the middle of the meeting. A little bit questionable way to deal with it. Going to disrupt the meeting if you do that. Not the way to really handle it, probably. What about if you get up and leave the room and talk or answer it someplace else? The problem with getting up and leaving the room is, is that you disturb all the other people in the, in the meeting. And so they're aware of what the situation is. The only time that this works well for me is when a person comes to me at the start of a program and says, I'm expecting an important call. I've got my phone on, si on vibrate. When it rings, I'm going to step out quietly and I'll answer it outside. I hope you understand. Would that be OK? And by alerting me to it ahead of time, then it softens the issue when it actually happens. And finally, the fourth one is simply to shut the phone off without answering it, reaching down and shutting it off. Not the easiest thing to do. You want to be able to look at it. And some people will even take it out and look at it and decide whether they're going to answer or not by who it is. That doesn't work. Just reach in, shut it off. Much better way to handle it, okay? Three tips for cell phone use in business today. The first one is that any time its use is going to bother people, turn it off. You want to be in control of your phone. You don't want to have to control you. And the easiest way I know to be in control of it is to shut the thing off and then come back and get your voicemails later on. The second thing is that if it does have to be on for whatever reason, put it into that silent mode like I just described in the last program. At least that way it doesn't bother people and then step out, talk 
quietly away. By the way, CEOs tell me that the biggest frustration they have, particularly in meetings with employees, is people using their cell phones during the meeting. That it drives them nuts and they want it to stop. And they're starting to, stop, they're starting to have rules about the use of cell phones in meetings. Finally, be aware of whether or not you're allowed to use it and be careful of using it in that meeting because that's, that's where you're really going to run into a problem with a boss or a manager, okay? Um, I want to sort of put this all together for you, finish it up with something that I call the 24-7 professional. And the best way I know to describe the 24-7 professional is to show you the following problem. On the way to work, you're driving to work, a person cuts you off, you swear, you make a rude gesture, which the other driver sees. Later, as you greet your new boss in the reception area, you both realize that you see, you recognize each other from that morning. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of things that when you make a mistake at work that you want to do, and obviously one of them is to take responsibility for your actions, apologize, recognize what's happened, and the people who have done this, who have explained to me that they've been in this situation have said they apologize profusely and they hope that the person will accept the apology. But it's not a good situation. What this situation really tells us is that your actions outside of work affect you in work that the things that you do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can have an impact on you at work. Um, I know a young woman who was going to work in New York City, going to his financial services firm. She was all dressed up with the exception of her shoes, which she was wearing flip-flops to walk to work in. She would put her business shoes on when she got to work at her desk. Well, the problem that she ran into was that one day, as she was arriving at the building and getting into the elevator, the CEO for the company was on the elevator with her. And it was an opportunity for her to really look good with the CEO. But all she could think of was how embarrassed she was that instead of having the right shoes on, she had flip-flops on. And she didn't like that situation. So she hadn't really thought about the fact that something as simple as having flip-flops on to walk to work in could have a negative effect on her at work. This is the last time she ever wore the flip-flops to work. So, actions outside of work affect you. Perspective matters. It's the opinion of the other person that makes a difference. If you look at yourself in a mirror in the morning and think, man, I look great, but when you walk into work or you go into that job interview or you're seeing a client and those people who you're seeing's opinion of what you're wearing is what on earth are they wearing that for? Whether or not you think you looked good or not, their opinion matters. And so the perspective of the other person is key to your success at work. The how matters. You have choices in everything you do. So make choices that not only solve whatever problem it is, but also in the process build the relationship, even if in making that choice it's a little harder on you. It's better on everybody else involved. And finally, think about those three goals. Think before you act. Make choices that build relationships. And do it sincerely. Because when you do that, you are a believable person, you are genuine, and you are confident. And if you're believable and genuine and confident, people will trust you. And if they trust you, they'll want to do work with you. They'll want to hire you. They'll want to promote you. Earn their trust, and you've got a really great formula for success in business today. And finally, because I love this phrase, think about anticipating people's needs and then exceeding their expectations. That's my talk for you today. I'd love to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, last night at dinner, I learned that you had also read the biography of Steve Jobs. I had read the biography of yes. Steve Jobs. Yeah. I read that, and that might have been a story of the rudest, meanest, nastiest leader I've ever heard of. How has he been successful, given the rules that you were just outlining? <laughs> um, he's successful because in his public persona, and the fact that he owns the largest corporation in history, um, 
He can get away with things that other people can't get away with. Um, I understand that he was incredibly forceful, if you will, with people at work. And he, he didn't suffer fools gladly at all. Um, what I think he was able to do was to overcome that by his sheer genius at what he did for the business. But he is the exception to the rule rather than the rule. And that's what made him possible to be who he is. Um, I wouldn't use Steve Jobs as a model for how I would run my business and interact with my employees. He could get away with it because of who he was. Um, if the business started not being successful, people wouldn't stick around with that for very long. Yeah. This may be along those lines somewhat, but we, a lot of us have watched the social network and Facebook's um, yeah. CEO. This idea that to be an entrepreneur, you wear blue jeans and a t-shirt and you are more laid back and break the rules. Is there a new uh, ethos emerging or do some of these same rules, are, will they always apply in business? Um. You know, when, when the CEO of, of uh, when Zuckerman stands up in front of a group and he's worth X number of billions of dollars, he can probably get away with anything that he wants to get away with. Um, I think that there is, let me back up, cultures. Different cultures have different rules. The dot-com culture has a very informal dress rule. People don't dress in three-piece suits. In fact, if, if you were to go for a job in Cupertino at Apple or to Facebook wearing a suit, you probably aren't going to get the job because you're not looking like you, you fit in with that world. Okay, So their culture allows Steve Jobs to wear the black turtleneck or Zuckerman to wear what he wears, and they get away with it because they've chosen to have that be the culture of their business. Um, other businesses don't have that culture. Uh, you go to Citibank, you go to a financial services firm, you go to a consulting firm, they're going to want to see you dressed in a suit. So one of the reasons they get away with it is because their culture and the culture of the business they've allowed to be that way allows them to do it. And that's fine. I'm, I wouldn't stand up and tell you that they're wrong. It's their business. They can run it the way they want to. I know law firms that will advise their partners when they're going to go visit with a dot-com client to dress down, to not wear a suit, so that they look like they relate to the people at the dot-com. But they go to see somebody at Goldman Sachs, they're wearing a three-piece suit. Yeah. I just wanted to know how you would handle that situation when you was driving. What you're telling us about how to... You mean the driving yeah. and making the gesture? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, the only way that you can handle that, that, that is to apologize to the person and tell them that, you know, you're really sorry, it was the heat of the moment, and you're very, very embarrassed, and you hope that they understand. Generally speaking, Americans are really forgiving people, and if you take responsibility for a mistake that you have made, you apologize for it, you try to have a solution for it, people will give you a lot of slack. They'll allow you to have that slack for it. What people won't do is if you refuse to take responsibility, if you go, it's not my fault, that's when the back of their neck goes up and they go, I'm not listening to that person. So if you get, you know, it's not if you're going to make a mistake at work. It is when you make a mistake at work, how do you fix it? And you fix it by apologizing for it and taking responsibility for it, and by having a solution to the problem so you don't make the problem your boss's problem. That's how you fix it. OK. I see a hand in the middle here. I wanted to know about the, the judge that made that like, racist comment about Obama. Like, since it was like a black joke almost, like, since he was a judge, it's like all his cases kind of get run back for him being biased? Um, it's a great question. And I know that one of the things that they were looking at, it's happened very recently, and there's been a lot of discussion about what this means for him, for his position there. Um, and I don't think it's totally resolved yet, to be honest. This just, I mean, this is really only two weeks old, two and a half weeks old. And um, he's, been, he's been out front. The one thing he has done, which I'll give him credit for, is that he's been very upfront about the fact that this was not an appropriate thing for him to do, and that he's apologized 
you know, and said, I, he said, I'm not a racist, I, I, you know, and it's hard to explain the thing away, but at least he's taken the step of not trying to deny it or trying to sweep it under the rug. He said, I screwed up and I apologize and I'm sorry that that's happened. Um, but whether or not it's gonna ultimately affect the cases and everything else, it's too soon to say. I, I don't know the answer to that. And I think it'll take a long time for it to, it might affect them if they had something to do that was a racially charged type of a case. But I'm not a lawyer to be able to tell you whether or not it's actually had an effect. But that, he has really, he's under the gun for what he did, no question about it. It's been a real ugly situation for him. Definitely, yeah. Formality seemed to be a had a more of a role yeah. uh, within society. There was a procedure or a process for everything that was part of daily life. Has a formality gone to a level where it's missed, and how much does formality relate to etiquette? And you think formality, if it has lessened, will it continue to do so? Yeah, yeah. I think we live in a more informal world today than we did in my great grandmother's day, for sure. I think there's all kinds of examples of that from, uh, the simplest example is calling cards that you used to take to a house and leave off and, and it was a very formalized process, a given day of the week that you went. And today, if you wanna go have coffee, you call back over the backyard fence and say, hey, you wanna have a cup of coffee? And I don't think either one is wrong. I think they're both good ways of doing it. I think we do live in a more informal world and manners do change over time and reflect where society is headed. And I think ever since the 60s and the flower power revolution and that, we've seen a wholesale change in the willingness of people to put up with that formality and want more informality in their world. It doesn't mean it's an easier world. I'm not sure that informality equates to making things better, but it's different and it's where we are right now. And I don't think we have as much formality as we used to. In some ways, people want it back. Businesses, for instance, have business casual now a lot. You know what's you, you ever heard of casual Fridays? Businesses had casual Fridays. You know what businesses are doing now? They're now having dress up Fridays. <laughs> they are, because you know, it made people feel comfortable to be dressed up a little bit. And so that formality of that dress and, and that the, in essence, uniform of the dress was something that they almost missed. And so it's the pendulum is swinging the other way. Yeah. Would you say that in the business world that the formality is one of the last strongholds? It seems in my belief that the business, there is a greater, uh, uh, need to dress it. Sure. And, and so it seems that they have held on to formality more than other professions. Do you agree or not? Yeah, I, uh, not even uh, other facets of life. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they do it because the formality helps them to structure how the business is run. And that makes sense to me. Where in our personal lives we can be more informal and that's okay. So yeah, businesses are definitely, uh, there's a little more formality to them and you see that out there. Thank you very much for coming this, this, this afternoon. I've enjoyed your talk. Thank you. It's been fun. Thanks again.